So Frank Conley's really good about asking questions. You spoke at Wisdom 2.0 and shared a bit about consciousness and sustainability in the startup culture creation process. So I'm not quite sure if that's a question or a statement, Frank. I'm asking, you just spoke at Wisdom 2.0. Right. Sure. Yeah, I'd love to. Hey, that's a great question. That's something I'd, I, uh, it's, I'd love to talk about. It's very topical. And so I was at this conference um, on Friday, and it's called Wisdom 2.0 in, in San Francisco. And we talked a little bit about the election and some things that I'd written and said on CNN um, after, right after the election. And uh, they were mostly about kind of the future of tech and, and kind of how we've uh, created this environment, which we don't really experience uh, here in, in tech, but we basically have created this series of optimization machines to try to get certain results, right? Like Facebook is a great example where we've basically created this, this, this system that we've, we've split test um, uh, that optimizes for attention, right? And, and because of that, and it's true of all of our social platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Reddit, um, we're rewarding certain types of content that we might not necessarily want to as a society, right? And all, everybody in tech, myself included, having built uh, you know, Justin TV and Twitch and other kind of social platforms, we're often really obsessed with figuring out how to get more attention without thinking what's the actual end result for society if we're successful. Uh, and I think that's a really important thing to think about because it turns out the things that get the most clicks, get the most views, get the most engagement are always the things that are best for us, right? They're not the things that are um, you know, outrageous headlines, right? Controversial headlines often get the most attention, but they aren't the things that are necessarily the most informative or valuable for society. And so it was interesting to me because I had never thought about that before, right? I'm, I'll raise my hand as the number one, you know, first person to admit guilt of just focusing on optimizing something and not really think about what the consequence is. And I think that even if you don't work on social media platforms, um, there's lots of examples of this in technology in Silicon Valley today. So, you know, I funded a company started by my brother and one of my co-founders from Justin TV. That's a self-driving car company. And there's lots of positive consequences for self-driving cars. Uh, they build a prototype that works really well and they sold it to GM last year. Um, but we're not really thinking, at the same time that we're racing to create self-driving cars and all sorts of other automation and robotics innovations, uh, we're not really thinking what's the actual consequence when those things are widely adopted and do they put a ton of people out of work and what do those people do, right? I don't think people in Silicon Valley spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, you know, Uber's adding like 500,000 to a million drivers every week. Um, I don't know what the exact number is, that's what I've heard. What happens when all those people are offboarded, right? Um, I don't think we think about that very much and, you know, this comes, doesn't come from pure altruism. Uh, it also comes from, you know, pragmatism when, when um, uh, there's massive societal disruptions in how people work or, and there's massive income inequality. Usually that results in very unhappy situations for both uh, people who are you know, disrupted or displaced and also uh, extremely rich people. So out of self-interest, I encourage all of you guys to start thinking out of, about what is going to happen when the goal that you're racing towards uh, actually works and becomes widespread. And I think we should spend more time thinking about that. I don't have any solutions, but that's what I've been, I've been worried about. All right. What have you changed in your actions when you think about your goal and now that you've achieved several of them? So the advice that you just gave to the audience, how are you viewing that for yourself? Well, um, one of the big questions for me is how can, does, does entrepreneurship alone have you know, enough impact or do we need to do something bigger, right? Do we need to either like, more society-wide safety nets that are, are, are going to have to be created. So some of the things that we're you know, researching at, at YC, right, things like universal basic income, um, are possible ways that we might uh, ease the transition from, uh, from you know, the society we have today to one where there's like lots of jobs that have been replaced through automation. I don't know if that's the right solution or, or the only one, but I think we need to spend more time researching and um, thinking about those types of solutions because uh, I'm confident, actually, that humanity will always find jobs for people, right? Things for people to do. You know, hundreds of years ago in the United States, we're mostly agrarian society. Now we've transitioned to, you know, social media influencer is now a job. <laughs> that was never a job before, right? We've created all these other jobs, advertising executives, programmers, uh, people who, 
you know, designers, uh, many more types of, there's, there's been a Cambrian explosion of, of, of work that people can do, and oftentimes it's much more fulfilling than the work they might have done hundreds of years ago, or more people have the opportunity to do more interesting work. Um, the problem is just like locally, you know, in the short term, how do you make that transition, right? And how do you distribute the, the wealth of society so that people are able to feel like they're partaking in the, the advancements of society? And I, um, I think that's our short-term problem. But over the long term, we're probably fine. Over the short term, we might be fucked. <laughs> but maybe not, maybe not, I don't know. So Ariel wants to know, should founders ever be concerned about sharing their secret sauce, the unique value proposition during early stages when speaking to investors? Uh, should you be concerned about people stealing your idea? I, um, I was very worried about people stealing my very first idea, which was a, an online calendar um, in 2000, <laughs> 2004 and 2005. And so I didn't really want to tell anybody about it. Um, and it turned out like people thought of an online calendar anyways. And there were, I, by the time we launched, there were you know, dozens of these guys out. Um, I think that in general, most people are not going to immediately quit their job and steal your idea, uh, even if it's a very good one, uh, because they have lots of momentum at you know, building whatever they're working on, right? And so I think it's very rare, although I have had friends who have regretted telling certain people about their ideas because they, you know, they, they kind of immediately turn around and clone them. But that's very rare, I would say. You know, I've worked with hundreds of entrepreneurs through Y Combinator, and, and I would say I've heard this story you know, maybe one or two times. And so, in general, I think, you know, my personal philosophy is that I, when I'm excited about an idea, I go out and tell everybody um, about the idea that I have, and uh, because I want to get feedback, and I want to get people excited, and I use the opportunity to tell um, my idea as a way to practice my pitch, right? And I know if that person's like, wow, that's a really good idea, how can I invest, or be a part of that team, or be part of it, um, then I know it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be onto something. And so, you know, I don't think there's, like most answers on, for startups or venture capital, there's no right answer, I don't think. Um, but personally, my, my strategy is to uh, spread my idea broadly and, and see what feedback I get and what um, serendipitous interactions I have uh, by doing so. At conferences, what are the most effective ways to find investors that share your visions and goals as a company? I don't think conferences are a good way to find investors that share your visions and vision and goals. Um, like immediately after this, I'm going to like walk out, kind of run to my car, and then drive back to San Francisco. <laughs> and there's probably you know there's lots of people who would like to have a conversation. The hard part is it's very overwhelming. It's hard to like stand out in a place where there's like tons of, you know, basically there's a supply demand imbalance, right? Um, so the best thing to do, I think, is to get introductions from other entrepreneurs that you're probably friends with who are maybe one step further along with you and get them to introduce you to people who might be interested in um, you know, your vision uh, and, and meet them on a, in, in a way, a setting that's not so much of a shark tank. I think conferences are a little, a little bit uh, set up in the wrong way to actually meet investors um, for, for your company. Sorry. But um, the good news is that those people are out there and you know, there's lots of other ways to meet them. And I suggest that you try one of those other ways. You know, warm intros are always, always uh, the best. Um, sometimes, I, you know, respond to like people cold emailing me or, or hitting me on Snapchat. Um, you know, you just want to make sure that you can, you know, to, in order to get someone interested in actually talking to you, I think you need to really quickly and concisely demonstrate uh, that you can teach them something. I know that's what I look for. I don't necessarily uh, go into um, try to like immediately invest in, in someone. Someone doesn't need to convince me that I want to invest right then, like over email. They just need to convince me that they can teach me something that's interesting enough for me to spend my time talking to them. Right? So I, I'll, I'll give you an example, actually. Um, on Snapchat the other day, someone was telling me how they were going to start an oyster farm. That was interesting to me. I like oysters. And uh, so I was asked to actually engage. He, he set it up in a very, very quick and concise way. That was not, he didn't say, hey, I want to raise money from you. Um, he was just telling me about his idea. Uh, and soliciting feedback, and I was asking him things, you know, like how much capital does it take to get an oyster farm started? Where, how do you, how is it different from like existing oyster farms? How do you, you know, what are the margins on oysters? I don't know any of that. It's interesting to me. Um, and so I think if you present your idea, there's no like silver bullet, right? But if you, if you present your idea in a way uh, where you 
are potentially teaching the you know investor or whoever you're you know cold emailing, um, you're teaching them something. I think that that works on me more often than not. All right. I'm so glad you said that because it's one of the things we tell them when they come to the local chapters is when you're wanting to find investors or you're wanting to find mentors do a little homework and find out how you can be helpful to them first. As a matter of fact, Anthony right down there is a master at doing that. Nice job, Anthony. <laughs> how does YC look at student founders? Student founders, so you know, we funded lots of people who were students uh, or who you know, are students. We usually look for people who are, uh, you know, we, we've switched, I think about six or seven years ago, after people kept going back to college after YC, we, we started thinking like we should just take people who are you know, committed to working on their startup. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty important. So you know, we, want, we, want, we don't mind if you haven't graduated or you're still a student or something, as long as you're going to drop out and actually work, commit to working on your startup for a significant period of time. Confidence versus arrogance. How do you judge the motives of a founder? I don't think arrogance is a motive, or confidence, actually. Um, but I think, uh, you know, really you want to have, a, like any investor is going to try to get to know the people and what their motivations are for doing something, right? Building the company. And uh, I don't know, there's a, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. I think that um, usually arrogant people are not receptive to having like an actual discussion, right? They're not like, they're, they want to, they're usually trying to get their view of the world into your head and it's like a one-way information channel, right? And I think that's pretty apparent sometimes when you're, when you're trying to give people feedback on their idea or, or dig into something um, that you have questions about and they're just trying to kind of go on with what their pre-planned th thing was. And um, I think usually that, that's the big red flag for me and, and a big you know, warning sign. So when you see something like that, Justin, do you just cut ties and walk away, or do you just get try up to give a 30 second? Leave my coffee and then walk out the 30 door. 30 second coaching to see if they respond to that? Uh, you know, usually I, the hard part is like when someone's arrogant in that way, they're usually not very receptive to feedback. So I, I try to like listen to them and try to, try to give them as much feedback as, feedback as I can, but oftentimes it, it's uh, a little bit of a lost cause in that, you know, 30 minute conversation or something. So it falls on deaf so, ears. I don't know, you gotta try, but. It, Would you I, say I, that personal development might be one of the topics that a lot of entrepreneurs need to spend more time in and they don't think about? <laughs> Maybe so, I, I think that, um, I, I think often people learn by doing. So you know, if they do this, if they go in with this arrogant pitch and they, if it doesn't work, then hopefully they'll take that feedback and, and react to it. Um, I know like everything I learned about startups and entrepreneurship and being a founder, I learned by actually, you know, on the job training, right? There's no way to, for me anyways, to like read a book or an essay or, or stuff online and learn a lot of these lessons. I had to learn the hard way myself. What type of companies are you excited about right now? Re what type of companies am I excited about? Um, I'm excited about companies that are Using, that use machine learning to do some sort of task in industry. So self-driving cars, probably a great example of that. Um, I'm excited about uh, companies that are, I think the, there's, there's gonna be a new wave of startups, actually there already are, that are verticalizations of uh, existing industries. So there's like a full stack um, solution to an existing industry. And like the first, the first wave of startups, I think um, often sold software to like all the different players in industry. So and then there was another one with, which might have been like cloud software. And then I think now a lot of those easy innovations are picked off and a lot of startups are actually doing, you know, a full stack solution where they own, um, you know, they own, uh, they own every part of it. Like Sprig is a great example where it's like, um, you know, they're, they're not just delivering from a restaurant. They also like basically are the restaurant, right? And the delivery service and the customer facing application. And I think there, there's going to be a lot more startups like that in every different vertical. So those are some of the ones I'm thinking about right now. So you might enjoy this. How is Whale doing? And specifically, how are users adopting the video answer format? All right. So Whale is my, that's a, that's a great question. Whoever asked it, thank you very much. Um, Whale's, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Whale's my new video question and answer app. Uh, I was basically answering all these Q&A questions on Snapchat, but they would go away. 
uh, after 24 hours. And so I thought maybe there was a better format. So I created a, an app, a very simple app that, that lets anybody ask uh, anyone a video, a, a question in text, and then the, they can respond with a one minute video answer. And uh, I think people like it. It's resonating with some people right now, mostly in tech. You guys should all download it and try it out. You can ask me a question there if you didn't get to ask yours right here today. Um, so I think it's, it, it's the core of something that people like. I think Q&A is a very fundamental behavior where people really want to ask other people questions. Uh, but I think we have a long way to go, and we're still working on iterating it and making it even more useful. And so it's, it's a, you know, like any startup, it's a grind. And we got to keep going and I think keep making our core value proposition accessible to more and more people. Will public policy, and it just moved on me, will public, stop, will public policy ever catch up with technology and what are the steps we need to get it there? Will public policy ever catch up with technology? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's, there's some fundamental uh, barriers to that happening. One is that the, usually people who are in power are not on the cutting edge of technology, right? The people who are elected, certainly in the United States, people who are elected officials are not usually scientists or technologists. Um, they're usually lawyers here. Um, but in, across the world, there are usually people who are older maybe not spending most of their time like in cutting edge technology and understanding what the implications are. And so I am pretty doubtful that it will, any significant changes would happen, um, unfortunately. So I don't know, I haven't really thought much about that. I wonder if there's a government design that can uh, enable more kind of awareness of technology in government. I don't know, that'd be something interesting to work on. What is your view on the ed tech startups? And education industry seems to have many pain points, but VC's enthusiasm to ed tech seems to be shrinking in the Bay Area. So can you repeat the question? Yes. What is your view on ed tech startups? And then they gave a comment after. Do you want to hear the comment? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I can answer that part, but I didn't hear the comment. Um, I think that, I don't know, I was actually very negative on ed tech startups uh, you know, previous to maybe this year, because I always thought about education as you know this credentialing process that you know getting people from K through 12 and then through you know college, and you know it didn't really seem to be a very um, like a means to like it, like it, it seemed a very indirect way way to get to achieve a result right. Usually people go to college and they don't learn any of the skills they actually need on the job or in the real world. It's just kind of a holding ground for people. Um, you know, and, and then this credentialing, this massive, you know, tragedy, of the, like prisoner's dilemma of like everyone needs to do it because if you don't have a college degree, then you can't get a job, but it's not really teaching you any of the things that you need to, to actually um, get a job uh, or, to, or, or any of the skills you actually need on a job. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can do in education now around like personalized learning to, to get a specific skill. And that's much more interesting as an investment to me. It's, it's um, I know like one example of that would be like Dev Boot Camp. One of my brothers went to Dev Boot Camp. He couldn't find a job after the you know, great financial crisis. And then he uh, ended up going to Dev Boot Camp in one of the very first cohorts. And he became a programmer and has been a programmer for the last five years. And so um, I think that was the first education innovation that I thought was actually really good, right? Obviously, I was personally affected by it. And so, and I think now there's, there's um, you know, I've heard of other ones, other interesting innovation educations, whether education innovations, like obviously there's MOOCs, but I think, um, I think there's a lot of like using basically an algorithm to teach someone something, right? Like um, that, that where there's like a, a very, we talked about this at the Wisdom 2.0 conference a little bit, where there's like a, um, a really well thought out pedagogy that teaches people stuff through an app or, or um, that's reactive. And I think that enables, like as long as I, I think the innovations of teaching people s specific skills that are useful uh, either for themselves personally or in their job, that's, that's an interesting area where there's probably gonna be a lot of innovation and maybe you can make money off of it. So our last question is about IP. How much effort and budget do you see seed stage companies putting into patents and best practices for NDAs? Um, I'll answer the 
last part first. NDAs, I think it's pretty hard to get any investor, if that's what you're talking about, to sign an NDA because they hear so many pitches, they fund so many different companies that um, they want to avoid any you know, grounds for you to, to be able to um, make a claim against them. Um, in terms of IP licensing, I don't, I don't know much about it. I've never filed a patent. Most, most of the companies um, that we work with don't pursue that in the early stages. Um, so, yeah, I'm probably not the person to ask, to be honest. So there's one more that got voted up, and I'm trying to find it because it's moving real fast. It's at oh, the right. top now. So statistically, female entrepreneurs rarely get funded. What are they doing wrong, or what are investors and accelerators doing wrong? Uh, well, I think uh, Sam just released a YC annual report that the you know, um, female and minority entrepreneurs get funded roughly in proportion to that, how they apply. I think what VCs, accelerators do wrong is that they don't, um, they're, they're not actually going out and pursuing those entrepreneurs. And I think that when you do actually pursue entrepreneurs from different backgrounds, like, like other than you know, what people see in Silicon Valley, they actually are, learn that like, yes, maybe y, y Combinator is a place that uh, will fund me. And I think that's a big problem like that, that disseminating that knowledge is, is a big problem and, and um, the problem that we've primarily had uh, because these entrepreneurs are out there, they're just not, like oftentimes they see Silicon Valley investors and they, they, don't, they look at who they've invested in and they don't think that it's an option for them. And so one of the big things that, you know, Michael Seibel, who's my Justin TV co-founder and now the CEO of Y Combinator, spent a lot of time out meeting entrepreneurs from different backgrounds and, um, you know, different demographics and encouraging them to apply to Y Combinator. And that's been a huge, that's resulted in a huge uptick in uh, entrepreneurs from those backgrounds. And so I think, investors have to go out and make it uh, something that they do to encourage those types of people to like, have conversations with those demographics of entrepreneurs and encourage them to apply to their accelerator or you know, if they're a, a normal VC, maybe just meeting them and then evaluating their business like that um, instead of just waiting for this for, you know, often people say it's a pipeline problem, but that implies that they're just like opening up their door and waiting for people to come in, right? And those people oftentimes don't never actually come in. They, know, they don't know it's, it's a place that, they, that will fund them. And I think that's a big problem. So let's give a huge startup grand round of applause to Justin. Thank Thanks. you so much.